implied that there is a receiver, right? You give something, but if it's not received, then it's kind of the half process there. It doesn't really work out very well because like giving a gift that isn't received, how do you feel? Let me just, let me just take a survey here. You feel what? Cruddy, rejected, like what? I gave my all, my best, and they didn't like what I gave them. That's, that, that's, that's why I just don't give gifts, you know, because it's like the fear of rejection. Because one too many times I gave a gift that was not well received. I want you to think of this from a perspective of God, our Heavenly Father. He gave the greatest gift of all time, the most amazing, most costly thing or person that could ever be given. Parents, put yourself in God's position for a moment. Pick your favorite child. Some of you, <laughs> some of you just got that, okay? Pick your favorite child. We're going to look in John chapter 3 in a moment, but my kids are rehearsing for their school play. And so Hannah is learning words. Her vocabulary is increasing, but there's still certain words that don't compute to a five-year-old. Like, like the word begotten. Okay? Like... I probably 90% of us here couldn't define begotten, and that's including myself. Steve Wickstrom would probably be able to define that, but, but I'm not sure exactly what begotten means. So here's the way the song went. God so loved the world that he gave his only forgotten son. <laughs> I actually got it on video until her, her teacher corrected her and said, no, it's begotten. Oh, it's begotten. I have no clue what begotten is. Forgotten computes, begotten doesn't. But I want you to think for a moment, and this may be your favorite child today, may be different than your favorite child from yesterday. Sometimes parents have this thing where certain children are not on the favorite person's list. I don't know if that happens at your house, but it's kind of a regular thing at our house, the rotation of who's on the favorite person's list and who's not based upon attitudes, actions, all that kind of thing. But I want you to think of giving your favorite child today, whichever one that is, I want you to think of investing that child into a process that will have great impact on others at the expense of you. Now, it's kind of weird to think of sacrificing your child. We know Abraham went through that with Isaac and all that. So I'm not asking you to think about putting a knife in your child. That probably wouldn't be thinking about your favorite child. That would be thinking about the one that's really annoying you right now. Hopefully, we're not going down that road. But... God gave his very, very best only begotten son, his one and only, as a gift. And that gift has largely been rejected. Now, some of us would say, we have received that gift. If I said, how many of you have received the free gift of salvation? Hands would go up all over this place, right? But have we really received the gift? I, I received a gift the other day, and nobody here, it wasn't a Christmas gift, but it was a gift that I had received for something, and I, I looked at it and I said, well, you know, I, I have quite a few of these, and... Um, I'm not really sure what I was going to do with it. It's a super nice gift. And it was in a nice gift bag and so forth. And how, how many of you, just be honest now, just be honest. How many of you have a re-gift box? Okay. You know what a re-gift is? Okay. A lot of you are liars today. <laughs> you all are lying. 
The re-gift box is when you get a really nice gift, but you really don't need it, and you're like, wow, that's a nice gift. So I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to get it out at the time. You know, you're, you're rushing off to some place, and you're like, oh, oh, my word, I forgot a gift. And, you know, you keep a little stash of cards, and so you pull out the card, and then you're like, I don't have time to go, and I don't let it. You go to the re-gift box, you pull. You all know what I'm talking about now, okay? For some of you, it's a gift card. You have a little thing, and you're just like, okay, that gift card will do. And yet, we don't fully appreciate the value. We appreciate the thought. But we don't appreciate the value of the gift as it has been given to us. And, and so we appreciate as Christians, we are so, oh, that was so nice of God to send his only begotten son for us. How sweet. Let's put a little manger up, put the baby in the manger, and let's sing a couple of Christmas carols and feel really good on Christmas Eve. Aww. How twee. And then we tweet nice things. And instead of it being the value of this wonderful gift received to its fullness is going to become absolutely transformational in you and me. I, how many of you have a GPS or a GPS on your phone? You got, you got that whole thing. Okay, so one of my kids was saying, um, you know, Dad, the GPS isn't working. And I happened to have that same GPS just a little bit ago. And, and so what the kid was saying, um, yeah, it says acquiring position or, or GPS signal lost. And sometimes this happens to us because we're going through a tunnel. When you go through the tunnel, what happens? GPS signal lost. You come out of the other side of the tunnel after a bit, starts talking to you again. And, and in this area of salvation, I think as Christians, we have gone through a tunnel where we don't appreciate the salvation and therefore we don't really fully receive it. If you're doing the reading plan for the church, uh, we're, we're in the book of John. And in John chapter 3, I want you to turn there and we're going to read verse 27 and then we're going to go back and we're going to read several other verses in the book of John. So John chapter 3, verse 27. Now to give you a little bit of background here, there are people that are coming to John, and they're concerned that Jesus is baptizing in the Jordan River. Well, it wasn't really Jesus, but it was his disciples that were baptizing. And they're, they're worked up a little bit about this because John has been the baptizer. He's the man. And when he says things like, I must decrease, he must increase, John's disciples aren't comprehending this. And so this is what he says, John 3.27. John replies, a person can receive, everybody say receive, only what is given them from heaven. Like I said, this is during a controversial time. Are we good receivers today? And what does that look like? This incredible gift of salvation. Go back up to John 3, 14. I'm going to read through 21, and I'm going to put an interlude after 15 and read something out of numbers that fits right there. Just as Moses lift up, lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone, how many people? Everyone. Who believes, what do they have to do? Believe. May have eternal life in him. That is, in Christ Jesus. Now what in the world is he talking about? The serpent being lifted up in the desert. Put a pause there. I'm going to read what this is all about out of the book of Numbers. Now, here's what I want to, I want you to hear this. This is a little sidelight. The Bible is completely interconnected with one another. It's not random at all. So when you read a passage of Scripture and you think, what in the world does that have to do with anything? 
the begats, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and you're just like, let me skip over that part. They are strategic in the message of the gospel. Not one word of scripture is irrelevant. Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. They traveled from Mount Hor, this is the Israelites, and they're, they're on the way to the promised land, along the route to the Red Sea, to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. Oh my word, he is talking to us today. We grow impatient on the way sometimes. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. I have one child right now. I will not mention his name. But he is under the age of 10. And I am working on the whining spirit. Anybody else that just jumps? Mm. Why can't I do this? I don't like this food. I don't like. Would you stop the whining? I see some of you parents smiling. And you don't have kids that are under 10. You're ribbing your spouse, okay? You miss. But, but this, this whining thing is nothing new. Then the Lord, come on now with a can of whoop them. Um, then the Lord sent venomous snakes. Who sent the venomous snakes? The Lord sent the venomous snakes among them. And they bit the people and many Israelites died. Lord, keep me extending grace to that little guy. And the people came to Moses and said, Oh, we have sinned. Don't you wish every correction brought the heart of repentance like that? We have sinned. And we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And this was God's answer. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake. Put it up on the pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole, and then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Those of you in the medical field, you know that little thing that's on the ambulance with the snake coiled around and the, and the thing, you know, it's, we look at that as the symbol of help is on the way. The professionals are here. Interesting. Probably most people don't know where that came from. Right here, numbers. So, John 3, just as the serpent was lifted up in the, in the uh, desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, where is the Son of Man going to be lifted up? What pole is he going to be lifted up on? And you know, every single one of us has been bitten by the sin bug. Every one of us. And only those who look to the free gift of salvation and receive that free gift to all its fullness will have life. That's good news, isn't it? Otherwise, we die in our sin and we are destroyed because of our sin and detestable whining. Well, I wish life is like it was back in the day. It was so easy before I had kids. It was so easy before I got married. It was so easy when I was just a kid and mom and dad took care of everything. It was so easy before I was in debt up to my eyeballs. It was so easy when I had that other job. It was so easy, blah, 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 blah. Because we have not fully received the life that comes through the gift of Jesus Christ. What would happen, church, if we stopped whining about what wasn't and we received what is? 
perspective. Our brain is in a battle every single day, right? We can either choose to be a whiner or we can choose to be a winner. And right there is the deciding factor. John chapter 3, verse 16, we read on. For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. The light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Jesus was sent to save you and me. But have we fully received his gift of salvation? I told you that I'm not a very good gift giver, and apparently I have um, made a lot of mistakes in that area. One of my fatal mistakes was in, uh, you, you don't need to laugh, dear. It's, it's fine, it's fine. I, I, was, helping, I was helping somebody move. And, and during the move, I came across something that I knew we needed in our house, and it was just so, it was going to be the perfect thing. So I took it and I put it in the back part of our garage, and I refinished it, and I spent all this time on it, getting it just, and I told my wife, she was going to be so happy with this gift, told my wife, yeah, it was a surprise, you know, and so I was like, ah, it's what you've always wanted. Guys, can I just say those words, don't ever use those words if you are not 100% sure, and even when you are 100% sure, be extremely cautious. Because when you roll out a refinished kitchen table and she's expecting a piano, it does not go well with you. Not go well. Does not go well. For years it has not gone well until I bought her the piano of her dreams that she picked out and she had shipped and I gave her the blessing. Because it was the right one then. (laughs) But how many times... Does something that we have always wanted or we thought was going to be the fulfillment, it just doesn't fulfill. And yet Christ is the one that when we receive this gift, he is the one and he is what we have always wanted and always needed. Guys, you know, Christmas is coming up, and my recommendation, just based upon a little bit of experience, 25 years of marriage and so forth, that unless your wife is requesting a vacuum cleaner or a blender, that, that probably something a little more impractical would, be, uh, would, would probably be nice, you know? You, you might have one of those women that really is just like, wow, that's the amazing blender that I've always wanted. But uh, if... if your wife is, is at all like my wife. Jewelry usually works a little better. It's just, you know, for some it doesn't, but for thousands of years, God has been grieving as he's watched creation destroy itself. He's watched 
creation destroy itself. Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 19. Some people wonder, by the way, if you have wondered why the law was put in place, and if you're a New Testament scholar and you say, you know, here, we're under the, the, the terms of grace now through Jesus. You're right. But why was the law put into place? Look in Galatians chapter 3. Do a study through this. 3, particularly verse 19. But he says, Paul says, the law was given because of transgression. It was added because of transgression until the seed, Jesus Christ, to whom the promise, which was given to Abraham, referred to, had come. In other words, everybody was going to kill themselves if there wasn't some sort of law in the thousands of years between the time when Adam sinned and Christ came. And so God put in the law Ten Commandments and, and the law to say, look guys, you need to abide by this moral code because by the time the seed comes, by the time Jesus comes, there's going to be nobody left because you would have lied, cheated, stolen, taken each other's wives, committed adultery, you, you know, forget the Sabbath, you didn't honor your father and your mother. It's, society would be a complete wreck. Wait a second, we're kind of going back to that now, aren't we? Even though we're on the side of grace, we've missed the fullness of the free gift of salvation. And that's becoming a disciple of Christ. We call ourselves believers, but are we disciples? Are we really followers of Christ? Let's just look a little bit at, at what that looks like, starting with grace, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. There isn't a person here that can become saved by your own work. But it is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I believe that believers will get into heaven. There's scripture that indicates that there's some people that are going to get in by the skin of their teeth. They're going to make it, but they're not fully going to experience the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. I don't know what that all looks like. I haven't been there. But I think that that is the way that I read Scripture. Disciples die to self, and believers simply acknowledge that Jesus died for their sin. Did you catch that? Disciples die to self. They follow Christ's example, and believers simply acknowledge, yeah, he is the Savior, but I'm not fully going to follow him. Believing is the basis for discipleship. It's the door. Jesus says, I'm the gate. Everybody that comes in, comes in through me. Would you today thankfully receive salvation by believing, but then choosing to become a growing disciple? I, I believe that that takes the, oh, it's the nice little you know, baby in the manger Christmas thing. Oh, that's so sweet. And would you take that message and say, I'm fully going to follow Christ every day and every moment of my life. I, I kind of liken it like this. I've heard people, we have a lot of you that have been in the military, um, and I've heard people that get upset when they get word that they're going to be deployed. Well, I never signed up to go to Afghanistan. What are you talking about? Well, then why, why did you sign up? Well, the recruiter said that I would get to see the world. Well, you're going to go see the world. There's a lot of sand over there. There's a lot of rock from what I understand. Might be a bullet or two, but you know, that's, that's, you'll, you'll get to see the world. Well, I didn't sign up for that part of the world. I wanted to see the cool stuff. Not to have people shooting at me. And besides, I wanted them to pay for my college. I mean, like, hello, that's a no-brainer. This is the message that we tell people about the baby Jesus in the manger and signing up to serve him. Oh, come. You know what? Your life is going to be better. Just come to Jesus. Kneel, your, you know, like the shepherds, you know, Jesus. 
kneel before the throne. No, oh, great, wonderful, sounds good in church. Until he asks you to become a follower and a disciple and to say, yes, sir, I'm all in. Where do you want me to go, sir? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? Oh, you mean I can't take that with me? Okay, yes, sir, I'm in. See, that's where the rub comes. And the free gift of salvation is put on the doorstep and we look at it from across the street and we say, hmm, wow, that's just really great. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Oh, absolutely. As long as he stays over there and doesn't meddle with my life over here. Am I talking to the right people? Because this is the way we often want to live in the comfort, not fully receiving the gift of salvation and making it our own. We have the baby Jesus, but our own conditions. Hmm? So what does a good receiver of the gift of salvation look like? I want to help you determine a little bit whether you have received the gift of salvation or whether you have just observed the gift of salvation and you believe for other people, you know, that's just really, really good. Are you a Christian? Oh, absolutely. I'm a Christian. Yes, I believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You bet. I'm in. Number one, receive the gift with thanksgiving. Re receive the gift with, with thankfulness. This gift cost Jesus everything. The least I can do is to be thankful. And you know what happens when I'm thankful? I then begin to use and utilize what he paid for, and I begin to incorporate that into my own life because I'm so thankful for it. Was anybody hard on the highway to hell before you met Jesus? Somebody said, when you're going to sin, sin boldly. And some of you took that and said, man, I'm all in. But you know the great thing? You know the great thing? This is what I see. Sometimes, when, when the, to whom much is forgiven, there will, there will be much love. And some of you that were running hard on the highway to hell, you might be a little rough around the edges, but you're running hard now after Jesus. Some of that stuff's just falling off the backside. I don't care where you are. That heart of thanksgiving and receiving that gift. I remember, of course, you know, uh, I love tools. By the way, thanks, uh, you know, that, that pastor appreciation winch that's on the front, you know, of my Jeep now. I cut it in there and stuff. I, I should post a video of that thing on the Facebook page if it, you know, wouldn't be too unpastorly, I guess. But, um, yeah, I, I took that thing out. I put it around a tree, and I was like, I was like pulling the tree down. It was like, it was great. It was, oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> is it <laughs> so so oh, I just got off on thankfulness there you know it's like thank you Jesus I, I got a we, we went over Bonnie and I went over years ago when we first bought our first house and we went over to this couple's house and they were you know probably about the age I am now and uh, he was getting ready to retire and he uh, he gave me a gift that I was so thankful for. I have a propensity for cheap tools. Most of them don't have a name brand on them. And, uh, and he gave me one that had Makita on it, brand new, in the cellophane. And I was like, John, thank you so much. This is the coolest thing ever. I have something that is like, not from Harbor Freight, it's awesome. And I, and I used that and used it and used it. And there was such a gratefulness and a thankfulness that he would give me this brand new gift and invest into my life. And so every time I used it, I had a heart of thanksgiving for John and Terry Jewell. When I remember what the cost is, I have a new appreciation for the gift. 
So I, I see a lot of you, if, if you have a cross around your neck, I want you to just grab that and just hold it up. A lot of you guys in the men's group have them, a lot of ladies have them. Just, just, just grab that cross. Every time you look at that, there should be a new appreciation for the cost and a thankfulness. Every time we take communion, the Eucharist, we have a thankful heart for the gift. Now what does that do? It transforms our whining into expectation. Right away. Right away. So what do I do with my child who will go unnamed that is dealing with the whining spirit? Let's just be thankful. What do we have to be thankful for today? And of course, like all good parents do, they talk about the starving children in Africa that have no food and the people that, you know, that kind of thing. And, and be, aren't you thankful that you have a roof over your head? Yes, I am, Daddy. Aren't you thankful that you have food to eat and you don't have to go to bed? Yes, I am, Daddy. Aren't you thankful for the peas and the broccoli? There's a long pause. <laughs> and now you're going to eat it. But are you receiving that free gift with thanksgiving? The second thing is, will you use that gift wisely? Wisely. What will you do with the free gift of salvation that you received this Christmas? Will you use it wisely? My wife has a, uh, has a, a t-shirt that she got from her cousin, and, it, and it, she has this um, little business called Momisms. And then it has little sayings on her niece. That, so I thought, what are the dadisms that I learned from my dad? Now, you know when you Google something and you put in a phrase and you hit it, and how many times do you, does something come up and it says like millions, okay? You got like 10 million things that the internet finds. I Googled my dadism this morning and there were only six. Like, man. The stock of my dad's words just went like, there's only six people in the world that ever thought of this. And I looked at them, and, and they were like they were kind of one-offs or things. This is real, folks. I'm going to share with you one of my dad's dadisms. This is going to change your life, okay? It's better than Google. Use it only for what it's intended for. The wrench wasn't made for a hammer. Use it only for what it's intended for. Now what if we took the gift of salvation, the free gift of salvation, we received it with thankfulness, and we used the gift of salvation for what it was intended for. We used it wisely. We went from just believing that it was a good gift to receiving that gift and then becoming a powerful man or woman disciple. That is what the free gift of salvation was intended for. Pete Scazzaro says this in his newsletter this week, and, and by the way, every single person here not only inviting you, I am imploring you to come to emotionally healthy spirituality starting in January, 3rd of January, right here in the fellowship hall. We're going to have uh, tables. It's going to be on Tuesday nights. Men's groups joining, women's groups joining. We're all joining together. I don't care if you've been through it once, twice. This is my fourth time through it. But we must become emotionally healthy. Pete Scazzaro is the one that is, he's doing the teaching. And this is what he says about the difference between being a believer in reference to being a disciple. A believer assents intellectually to what Jesus and scripture says. But their lives are not directed by him or oriented around him. We ascend intellectually to the free gift of salvation, to what Jesus said. Oh, pastor, I believe in the Bible. It's good stuff. Woo! Wow. Glory be. We would in essentially believe it, but it would not direct our life 
or be oriented around him. Jesus is there in your life, but he's not Lord of your life. That's discipleship. Live, folks, live like a redeemed person. Be a disciple. Think like a disciple. Act like a disciple. Have your mindset like a disciple. Because you're so thankful for his free gift on the cross. Receive it well. Don't just put it on the shelf. Number three, we use it wisely. We have a heart of thanksgiving. And then number three, we think of the giver often when we use the gift. I have a friend that I, I, I was walking inside the house it was one day this week, and I looked at my shoes, and I, I remembered the person that gave me these shoes, and I began to think, wow, that person has given me, I think, three pair of shoes. Maybe it's their love language. Maybe it's, uh, it wasn't my wife either, uh, has the spiritual love language of shoes. But the, the whole thing of, of going in shoes that were given to me, every time I look down or place my foot, I think of this person. I have a winter pair of shoes that they've given me. I have a summer pair of shoes that they've given me. I couldn't think if I had any more. But it was one of those, wow, I think of the giver when I use the gift. Remember, it's not just about the free gift of salvation, but it's the one who provided the salvation. The giver, that's how we can say this, this thing. Well, it was the thought that counts, right? Because it wasn't so much the gift, but it was the thought behind the gift, and that thought goes to the giver. I know that the person meant well when they gave me this, this gift, and I appreciate them for thinking of me and giving me this gift. It's just double blessing when you like the giver and the gift. Okay? But remember him, not just his gift of salvation. So here's, here's where we wrap this up today. We are all destined for destruction as soon as sin enters into the human DNA. Adam sinned. Therefore, Adam's seed or his children, their children's children, 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 all the way down to us, we are bent on destructive behavior. Hmm. That's human nature. Without an intervention, we, we are doomed and we need to be rescued. Enter the salvation process. Christ, the free gift of salvation that will cost us everything. Let that sink in. Coming to Christ is free. But it will cost you everything. It will cost you your life, your thoughts. It will cost you your finances. It will cost you your time. It will cost you your mentality. It will cost you your pride. It will cost you every aspect of your life that you hold on to. It must be surrendered to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Some things change over time, but our need for redemption will always be there. So today, what does it look like for you and me to receive this gift of salvation? For some of us, it's going to be praying and inviting Christ to come in at a new level, at a disciple level, as opposed to to a believer level. Going from intellectual to actual. How has Christ impacted your life this week? How have you made different decisions based upon your love for Jesus this week? For some, our heart of thanksgiving just needs to go to a new level. We've forgotten what it cost Jesus and we've forgotten to be grateful. There's nothing that is more discouraging for a giver than to have an ungrateful recipient. They open the gift. You're so excited about giving your best and you've wrapped it up and you've given it. And then they say, oh. And that's when you want to punch them in the face. 
out. Children of Israel in the desert. We don't like that food. That, we're tired of manna. All right, I'll punch you in the face then. All right, I'll send snakes. How do you like them, huh? Barbecue those, huh? But, but we just need to become more thankful, church. And, and for some of us here, we, we need to become a disciple, not just a believer. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay the gauntlet out right here. And I'm going to say, if you today have been flirting with becoming a disciple, but you are stuck on being a believer, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to throw down today, and I'm going to say, would you jump in with everything that you are, reckless abandon, sign on the dotted line, send me where you need to, I'm going, because you left your perfect home in heaven and became the gift. What's the least I can do? What's the least I can do? And today's your day to become a disciple, not just a believer. For some of us, we just need to be reminded every day of the importance of that gift. You know, when we look at the, the shoes, we're reminded of the giver, not just the gift. We appreciate the gift, but we're reminded of the giver. Thank you, God, for sending your only begotten son. You didn't send the forgotten leftover son. You sent the one that you loved the most. And would you just receive a new appreciation for your salvation? Becoming a disciple. Pete Scazzaro says later on in that article, he says that as a disciple, we're listening for his direction. We're loving scripture. We are self-aware. We rest in his presence. We become emotionally healthy. We serve and we give. We participate in community. We do all of these things as a disciple as opposed to an observer that sees, oh, that's what could be. And I believe in those things. I just don't do them. So today, church, Today, in this Christmas season, can we be good receivers, please? Could we delight our Heavenly Father in receiving His very best gift? We have a, a sign out front that says, Every person moving forward in Christ. That's us. That's me. That's you. Here's the posture that I want to take. My favorite. Hands right here. Lord, I give you and I receive. I give you whatever that is that I want to hold on to. Palms up. And I receive whatever it is you have to give. And today, that's the posture that I'm taking as a receiver of the good gift. And that's the posture that I'm going to challenge you. Now please, do not take this lightly. God will take you up on this. So don't let peer pressure, because the person next to you stands and holds their hand out, don't let that draw you into something you're not willing to follow through on. Well, my... My, my friend went and signed up on the dotted line and, you know, I just kind of followed after him and now I'm with them in Afghanistan. Well, this is your commitment. You and only you can be the receiver. The gauntlet's been laid. Believer or disciple. I'm going to read John 3.16. One more time. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. As a disciple, I don't want to just receive heaven by the skin of my teeth. I want to receive eternal life. Next week, we are going we to hit John 10.10 10 hard. And what does it look like to receive abundantly, super abundant, 
life. Week after that, what does it look like to receive the Holy Spirit? When Jesus blew on them, John 20 says, receive the Holy Spirit. What does that look like for you and for me? Today's salvation and being a disciple. So on three, I'm going to ask you, if you want to say, I am, I am all in. I'm all in. I want to receive fully what he has. And I want to be a disciple, not just a believer. I want you to stand. One, two, three. And would you put your hands out like this? And just say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I receive your gift, the fullness of your salvation today. The fullness of your salvation today. With a thankful heart, I receive. Help me to use it for what it's intended for in my life and the lives of others. And oh, may I think of you every day, the good giver. Not just the gift, but the good giver. Oh, I love you, Lord. Do you just express your love for him and your thankfulness in your own words? Make this real. Make that commitment real. Give the Lord the words that you would, would reflect your heart for him today, inviting him into that new place of discipleship. Oh, may, maybe there's somebody here today where you've been holding back something that's been keeping you from being a disciple. And you say, today, Lord, I give that to you. Would you verbalize that to him, whisper that to him? Maybe you need to shout it to him. But would you give that to him today? And you, you maybe you're here and you've had angst towards God because things haven't worked out the way you thought they should. And you've been angry at God and you've been saying, God, I am just I've had it. I'm not giving up on you, but I'm sure not enjoying myself. Today, would you just let that go? And would you receive it with a heart of thanksgiving? And watch what God does immediately in you, in your situation. God's downloading and he's speaking to you all over this place right now. Some of you are going to need to get a pen. You're going to need to write it down. There's some people that you need to forgive. You know, just, just as you've been forgiven... The Word of God says you won't be forgiven if you don't forgive. So you need to forgive. You need to let it go. It's part of being a disciple. Believers observe forgiveness. Disciples practice forgiveness. That cross is powerful. Powerful. Let's sing this together. Continue to do business with God. If you need to come to the altar, you're more than... Uh, it's open. Come and let God do what God does. Put the word into practice today. Strength from, from day. day.